Patricia Grace. I'm curious what he and his team think they have that could get him off of these charges. So, Florina, what do you think uh, the defense game plan is here? Do you, do you think they're going to, I think they're going to challenge the DNA evidence. It's such a major piece of evidence. So what are your thoughts in answering Trisha Grace's question? Well, just like in any criminal case, the defense does not need to prove innocence. What they need to do is raise doubt that is reasonable. And I think there are some weaknesses in this case. You have DNA issues for sure. You have two eyewitnesses that really can't, from what I understand, testify to any specificity that he is the person who was in the home. They saw a what appeared to be a male in dark clothing. There's no details about his face. There's no details about whether it's even a white person or a black person or an Asian person. And so those are going to be questions that I expect the defense will raise if this goes to trial. Now, I think unfortunately for this defendant and for all those internet sleuths out there in the universe, uh, he's left quite the fingerprint online and I think that's ultimately going to be the evidence that sinks him as the prosecution gets deeper into the online fingerprints that he's left on this case. And, and I think you're right about that, Florina, because if there are indeed, as been has been reported, an electronic kind of breadcrumb trail here, uh, if, if he is indeed uh, this famous Facebook poster, Papa Roger, that he's going to have to explain that. That's that's going to be something, even though he doesn't have the burden of proof, he's going to have to explain that. Uh, ben, I want to throw this next question to you. We've already kind of talked about this. Laura Magdalena from Facebook is asking, will this be televised? Uh, we think possibly it could be. It may not be live streamed. But I kind of want to take her question a step further and ask you about the gag order in this case, Ben. Uh, you've tried a case that was watched by millions and millions of people around the world. Uh, what are your thoughts on the gag order in this case? I'm generally not a big fan of the gag orders. Uh, call me naive, but I do think that juries listen to the judge, in this case, Judge Judge, and abide by his or her instructions. So I, I tend to think it's, it's not necessary, but I know others, there's a different school of thought on that as well. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, uh, as so our viewers know, there's a coalition of media outlets challenging that gag order, and law and crime is a part of that. Uh, you know, we can't ask simple legal questions of the attorneys in this case because this gag order that was issued is so restrictive, and it's it's almost like a blackout on information. We've been denied public records through public records requests. So there's a lot going on with this particular gag order, and right now there's a scheduling conference underway to look at those issues right here inside the courthouse in front of Judge Judge. Our, our next question, uh, Dave Ra David Rava from YouTube asks, can testimony from the grand jury now be used to impeach a witness during trial? Uh, Florina, what are your thoughts on that? Of course. Um, Testimony from grand jury is often used at trial for purposes of impeachment. Now, the witness who testified at grand jury has to be the witness that's testifying at trial for that person's testimony to be used against them. Anything that they say that is inconsistent can be used for impeachment purposes. Do, does the defense have to request the grand jury testimony? Is that automatically handed over in discovery, Florina? The grand jury testimony is sealed from the public. Sometimes it is redacted and there are portions that are sealed even from the defendant by court order. But the defense attorney is entitled to it and always gets a copy. Most of the time they get the complete copy unless the prosecution moves for a specific protective <clears throat> order to either remove some identities of the people who testified from the defendant and usually that's when they believe that there's some sort of concern with witness tampering and that's more often in federal cases linda i'm going to send this next question to you it's from at robo underscore van from twitter what is an example of evidence that the prosecution does not have to turn over to the defense hypothetically speaking 
Okay, so uh, we actually had this huge discussion on the show, Angela, this morning when you were in court about the prosecution denying the turnover of the investigative, investigative genetic genealogical, genealogical evidence, okay? They said that that doesn't prove innocence, so you are not entitled to it. So generally, uh, anything that's used at trial, the, the defense is entitled to. Anything that shows innocence, defense is entitled to. But, of course, the defense doesn't want the prosecutor being the one to determine whether something proves innocence or not. So that's where the fight usually goes on as to what the defense wants, what the defense gets, and what the prosecution is willing to abide by. And many times a judge has to rule upon those issues. But Angela, I just wanted to bring in one other thing. There was a mention of the uh, what may be issues in the case. Uh, we wanted to find out uh, whether or not the DNA was totally used, the one that was on the button of the sheath, when they were testing for his DNA and whether any DNA was left that the defense could use. I think that could be a really big issue in the case we don't know the answer to. And sometimes the samples are so incredibly small that there isn't anything left for the defense to test. And then they have to have their experts just simply analyze that. Uh, I think it's interesting, Linda, that you brought up that point about the genetic genealogy. I had spoken to an expert in that back in January, CC Moore, and she said that's an investigative tool. So this stuff does not come up in trial typically, the, the use of genetic genealogy, because it's used to kind of in the background to try to determine uh, somebody's family tree. So that's a really interesting thing, and it'll be interesting to see if that is challenged as well. Our next uh, question, at Moore, 045-155-085, Pat Moore from Twitter. Uh, is Brian Koberger's family still proclaiming his innocence? I'll take that one. Um, as far as we know, they are still standing behind him. Jason Labar, his former public defender in Monroe County, Pennsylvania, who represented him really for just a few days, had told me that Brian Koberger hopes to be exonerated. So that is something that was stated months ago. We haven't heard anything different um, since then. So I'll take that one. Uh, do we not get to see the other motions set for today? Nick Jacks 222 will be uh, feeding those out to you as soon as we get the images, uh, which could take a little bit of time as those hearings are still underway. Uh, Ta Tanya Daniel, or sorry, uh, Tanya Daniel from YouTube. Who is the lead prosecutor in this case? Uh, Florina, tell us about the lead prosecutor. So the lead prosecutor has significant experience trying cases in Moscow, Idaho, and for the county there. We don't know for sure whether that prosecutor is going to be the prosecutor trying the case or whether the team will expand. I would expect that if and when this case goes to trial, there's going to be a team of at least two, but possibly as many as four or five prosecutors trying this case as a team effort. Um, Another thing to consider is they're going to have 60 days from this entry of the not guilty plea to decide whether they're pursuing the death penalty. If this becomes a death penalty case, it becomes significantly higher exposure and they may reassign the case to a different prosecutor who does death penalty cases or expand the team to include a death penalty prosecutor specifically. Uh, yeah, and I, I think it's interesting you point that out as well because they do have the 60 days, the prosecution does, to let the defense know whether or not they will seek the death penalty in this case. And that will, of course, lengthen the trial from six weeks, which it's currently set for right now, uh, to much longer because if there's a conviction, there will be the mitigation phase. Uh, Ben, I'll throw this next question to you. Word 789 from YouTube. How strong is the case against Brian Koberger? How, how strong do you think it is based upon what we've read in the probable cause affidavit? Well, I would go back to a point that uh, Linda and Farina, Florina made about uh, the digital footprint or the breadcrumbs that he apparently left. I think those, I, I think juries are now sophisticated. You know, they, they're used to seeing that kind of uh, evidence used, you know, when they watch the, you know, the Law and Crime Network and when they watch, uh, you know, the, the shows, the dramatic shows. So I, I think that's going to be compelling. I think the DNA evidence, though, though it will be subject to challenge, is going to be compelling as well. So it, it seems uh, on its face to be a strong case. 
And we will see once it gets into the courtroom, into the trial phase, and maybe even into motion hearings, just how strong that case is, because we may learn a lot more as pretrial motions are filed and those are argued in court. We are going to take a quick break. So keep those questions coming to us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. We'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, but for now, we're coming to you live from Moscow, Idaho, in front of the Lataw County Courthouse. I'm Anjanette Levy, and you're watching Law and Crime. Stay with us.